Welcome back. It is a brand episode of Two Please. I'm your Sabin, and I'm your co-host Rohit. Hey, we have a guest today, dude. Uh, I'm very glad to introduce to our lovely community the indomitable Fala Faisal. For those of you who don't know, uh, Fala is the author of um, the nation's most controversial comic, Muslim Man. Fala, for his entire the entirety of his life, has been a very controversial figure. There was a point in his life where he was like, dude. I want to see just how much I can push the envelope. As a matter of fact, a lot of his videos are now being repurposed on WhatsApp groups to be, you know, as part of like political propaganda. Uh, he is a journalist. He's a stand-up comic. Uh, he's also my late-night movie companion buddy. Uh, whenever we there's a movie to watch, and if there's a movie that's gone completely gone under my radar, Fala's like, bro, will you come? Let's go. Uh, but yes, uh, Fala, welcome to the show. I'm so I apologize for the random, incoherent introduction, but thank you for coming on. <laughs> I hope you edit this better, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> nice to be. I don't usually like do podcasts, but because I don't watch podcasts in general, I just find it as I like. I don't know. For me, podcasts never appeal to me as a medium. But I'm like, okay, let's do one and see how it's like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but okay, what are we talking about today, my friend? I mean, today's topic came from Fala, but I'll let Rohit introduce it because I've been talking for too long. <laughs> Good. I'm like, why are you asking me? Makes sense. No, so what we're essentially talking about today is movies that are based on graphic novels but are not about superheroes. I mean, I'm sure there's a shorter, more succinct way of putting that, but essentially that's what we're talking about. And I think uh, the idea behind it was to challenge ourselves to get move beyond the whole trope or the convention of comics just being around superheroes, right? There's there's more to uh comics beyond mm-hmm. just paranormal or super powered indiv- individuals so and there are a lot of interesting stories out there some of which have been adapted to film we're going to try and discuss some of them uh not all of at least one of my selections is definitely not a good movie in my opinion it's an interesting watch right so hopefully yeah. you guys get a mixed bag some some nice critically acclaimed ones some fun watches and and the idea is to sort of get people to think about graphic novels beyond the superhero I think that's that's what we're hoping to do today. But yeah, with that, sure. let's start the show. Okay, so before we begin, are there any honorable mentions that you want to do? I think three hundred should be an honorable mention. I think uh, when it comes to adaptations, I think Zack Snyder. Watchmen and even though Watchmen is still about superheroes, but 300, it's attention to detail, it's translation from comic to film. I think Zack Snyder actually, like, we have the DCEU because of that movie, I guess. And a case can be made up uh, that those Spartans were more or less superheroes as portrayed in the movie. Nothing seemed to stop them. Almost, <laughs> Almost crazy, right? Um, yeah. An honorable mention, I have. Again, this is kind of skirting the rules a little because the source material is not exactly an, a manga, more a Japanese light novel, but uh, I want to talk about Edge of Tomorrow for a quick minute. We have yeah. spoken about the movie huh. in the Rewatchables episode, but All You Need is Skill, which is the Japanese light novel uh, from which the movie is adapted. Uh, again, I haven't read the source material, but Abin and I have uh, waxed eloquent about our love for the movie. It kicks ass. The movie kicks ass. Uh, yeah, I and I, I love Edge of Tomorrow. It has, as we have, as worth mentioned, we've spoken about it in explicit detail on on previous episodes. Uh, my honorable mention is a movie I would have liked to have included on this part. Uh, it is it is from a manga. Uh, I have not read this particular story in the manga, but this is a movie that came out last year, and it's called The First Slam Dunk. Uh, with, and it is directed by the author Takahiro Inoue. So, in a way, is responsible for two manga uh, series, like two of the most legendary manga series in, uh, in for coming out of Japan. The first being Slam Dunk, which was a huge uh, cultural movement in the 90s. And the second being Vagabond, which is about this lone samurai, which is considered one of the best stories to have ever come out of, uh, serialized like stories to come out, come out of Japan. And in a way, I went and directed the first Slam Dunk as well, which is a phenomenal movie. It's anime. It's anime. It's an anime movie. It's on Netflix everywhere but here for some reason. Uh, and it has probably some of the best depictions of, of basketball, of a basketball game. It's set in a high school. It's like a high school basketball game, which is then with the narrative weaving in and out of the game for each particular player. As a matter of fact, the main protagonist of the anime is not the hero of this story. It's somebody else altogether. And it's so well done and it's so tastefully done. 
Uh, I would have loved to have included it, but I don't think any of the, us in the panel have watched it as, a, as opposed to the others, other films on this list. So I've, I highly recommend that you go check it out. It is so bloody good. Uh, and hopefully it pops up on next Netflix or in some time. But there are other places for you guys to go check it out if you can. Uh, the first Lamb Dunk is, is my mention. But anyway, uh, with that aside, let's quickly jump into everyone's twos. We have now shortened the threes to, the, to a list of twos. Yeah. In order for to like maximize on time, the last time we did this with with Ravi, uh, 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 the previous guest, we were here for two hours. So let's we don't want we don't want to do that again. Yeah. So, so let's quickly like uh, follow up because you being the guest, uh, please get us started. Okay, I think yeah. the the first film on my picks uh, uh, is uh, Sin City. Sin City is a film directed by Robert Rodriguez, based on a graphic novel by Frank Miller. And I think Frank Miller also co-directed the film and, and Quentin Tarantino also like had a scene that featured in it. This is a film that came out in 2005. And I think was a landmark film when it comes to comic book adaptation because it's use of green screen and digital filmmaking. So I think that would be my first pick. I love uh, Sin City. At least the first one, A Dame to Kill For, I couldn't be bothered. But, uh, which is the yeah. sequel. But the first one with just generally the cast that they pull together and the whole and the Mickey Rock story. The Mickey Rock story tied in with the, the Bruce Willis story is uh is up there. What's the guy called? Yellow Bastard, is he not? Uh the the Nick yeah. the, the Yellow guy? Bastard or something. Uh, ugly yellow bastard, something. Yeah, but the, uh I remember watching it for the first time in 2005 and being completely blown away by it because I'd never seen anything like it. And I at this yeah. point got really enthused with with frank miller's body of work because somebody mentioned to me he has like oh this is just like the tip of the iceberg this man has done a batman graphic novel called the dark knight returns which could have been another adaptation shout you know for all we know um but no but the, it's superhero bro it's batman it's in the name yeah correct correct right 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 oh, of course oh, never mind sorry 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 it's been a while. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> my bad, my bad, my bad. Anyway. Who do you think is the Dark Knight of <laughs> The Bruce Wayne story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Uh, but yeah, this was like my introduction to, to the world of Frank Miller because uh, soon after this 300 followed, we just mentioned, mentioned it on the pod. Uh, and um, I think there was a movie called The Spirit, which he directed in 2008, uh, which I also watched and was complete ass. That was after... Uh... After Sin City. Yes, yes. It was so, the cash grab after Sin City that didn't go very well. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And uh, But Sin City, so much of it, man, is it so beautifully stylized. Elijah Wood as this weird cannibal uh, guy with long claws was kind of creepy. Um, yeah. I mean, f- a fun watch. A little off the rails at points. The, the whole uh, Clive Owen, Benicia Del Store. Oh, dude, I, all of this is coming back to me. I went like watched that movie in about, in about a good 15 years, but a lot of a lot of yeah. that imagery is slowly, slowly coming back. Yeah, I mean, in fact, the Benicio del Toro scene in the car is actually directed by Tarantino. They were friends and like Tarantino is a full like, you know, pro-film person. Like he doesn't like digital filmmaking, but when Rodriguez was doing this thing, they were, let me come on board, direct a scene and see what this shit's like. And he directed mm. the conversation between Clive Owen and Benicio del Toro in the car when he's the talking head. I thought he'd done the sequence prior where Benicio Del Toro becomes the talking head with that entire bloodbath sequence involving the, the prostitute gang. But okay, fair enough. What, what a sentence to string together, bro. <laughs> Did you just hear what he said? It's the movie. <laughs> it's the movie, guys. But what can I say? Right, uh, no, fair enough. I remember uh, being... Uh, uh, I think the Elijah Wood character left the deepest impression on me because the last thing I'd seen him in was the LOTR trilogy and... What? I remember, I was like, damn, Bilbo kept the rings, looks like. <laughs> but Frodo <laughs> kept the ring. <laughs> it's, it's turned him yeah. completely. Uh, very, very... Uh, and now, obviously, Elijah Wood has made a career out of doing things that are very unexpected and uh, you know, out of turn for him. He's he's built this beautiful little niche for himself. Uh, but in, I mean, in hindsight, now it seems obvious that he would take up roles like these. But I, I remember, and those round shades of his which were yellow against i remember that that image is so like seared into my mind and yeah. uh, like you were saying i mean right flashes of the story are coming back to me but i don't think this is the sort of movie where you were needed or expected to pay too much attention to the story it was very 
stylized visual showcase right and i think just uh, similar to the movie we were discussing last week tumbad uh, it's got a very distinctive color palette and like you were discussing over the week up in sort of a tarantino rodriguez these are people who who bring you know exactly what to expect stylistically from their films and uh, this is in in an in that sense and uh, you know the archetypical rodriguez movie uh, in many ways right it's that you you just know that it's packed to the brim with that flair of his and it feels like a graphic novel come to life right in in that sense it doesn't feel like a movie it's got that aesthetic i think a lot of us also like uh, i think my first introduction to robert rodriguez was through spy kids growing up i think spy kids 1 and 2 yeah. was how we were introduced to rodriguez so like as from going from children's like movie to like sin city was like a huge jump i think i was like in that phase where i was discovering tarantino just then they had seen reservoir dog that pulp fiction around the same time and like we watched smoke by this guy and i was like hey let me check out this film called sin city so i watched that and it was like one of those it kind of like completely blew my mind when i saw it i have gone through the process of reading the graphic novel multiple times i have read the whole sin city from beginning to end like at least two three times at least that i can remember i had seen the movie i think like uh, even my first short film was like sort of a homage to sin city in my opinion like i looked at sin city mm-hmm. and hey i was like i want to do something exactly like this so i picked a comic book made it black and white uh, uh with those red highlights so like my first short film in fact was like a complete imitation homage to sin city so it is one of those films that kind of like transformed me like it put me in the direction ki hey like, hey i want to make movies and i want to make movies like this was sort of like what sensitivity was why sensitivity is so important to me that's nice it also had uh, i mean it, i mean a side note and i'm like he had he fala just waxed eloquent about his like how would the movie inspire how the, the graphic novel has inspired him to be you know to pursue the line of yeah. work that he's currently pursuing and i am in here i am coming in to talk about how we were all just staring at jessica alba on a table at the age of what, <laughs> 13 to 14 years old just being like holy hell what is, just, what, what, what is happening um but yeah um that was sincerely let's move on to number two uh my number one rather and i think this was like if you talk about non-superhero graphic novel adaptations this is probably on everybody's list uh this is the road to perdition series or the road to perdition movie that came out in 2003 now there's a whole series of these books right there's road to perdition i think there's return to perdition is the final one there's a road to purgatory somewhere in the middle and it follows the story of of michael sullivan's uh michael sullivan senior's family like going on from junior so on and so forth but i haven't read all of those what i have done is i have watched the movie and mm-hmm. as far as adaptations go holy shit what yeah. a beautiful film and i and i remember this movie came out in 2003 2004 around that time yeah. uh, directed by sam mendes star- starring tom hanks daniel craig motherfucking paul newman uh, i think in his last, last ever role, movie role so and it tells the story of this uh, i mean last on the screen guy. role cuz cars exists mm-hmm. but fuck cars mm-hmm. right <laughs> Yeah, it tells the story of a of a father trying to protect his son from the mob that he is a part of and it's the journey of what they go through to uh to, to get through it and I remember watching it as a child and being very moved by it and So hmm. even Road to Perdition is not a film that you think of as a comic book film or a graphic novel film yeah. to be honest like it's like one of those things you see it it's a Tom Hanks movie it's like a prestige project like you don't really associate it with like being an adaptation you think of it as an original work it's only like when you open up the wikipedia page and you like look at oh it's adapted from so and so that you will even know that it is a film that is adapted because it's like you can't really tell uh, it's comic book influence when you actually watch the film i think at least for the mm-hmm. first time yeah no i agree in fact uh, again one of the this was around the time when i was getting into paul newman uh, for la for context paul newman is my favorite Uh, like male movie oh. movie actor and i i was getting into butch cassidy i had i think just about then watched this thing and uh, then i around that time i watched road to perdition i was like damn this guy like was batting 100 right up to his final role like just knocking it out of the park very impactful his screen time isn't a lot but uh, his presence looms over the duration of the film cuz he is the the big boss who or he's rather the reluctant baddie right he knows his son is in Danny Craig is a bit of a loser or you know a malignant character 
but you have to perform these roles that you have to protect your son even though you know he's he's wrong and he's very reluctant he and he loves michael but he knows michael has its own his own principles and you know they are like okay we have to do this so he brings that energy to to screen really well the one thing that really stuck with me uh, beyond just the movie is the score i think thomas newman gave the yes. score uh there's a particular track called rock island 1931 which is that whole bagpipe irishy sounding music it's it's very nice very haunting and i think that's one of the late motifs in the film so uh music is something i listen i think i listen to that rock island track at least once a week once a month even to this date i mean i watched the movie last i think 10 15 years ago but i think if i had to sum sum up that movie in one sentiment it will be melancholy right you it's, wow. the whole movie is a bunch of characters re- acting reluctantly because they have some sort of uh, you know code of honor to follow and it's a very you know a tragedy playing out in slow motion you're like guys if any of you just decided to do the logical thing instead of the honorable thing this would get over very quickly but no you know everyone has yeah, to yeah. see their uh actions through and you just feel sad at the end right like none of this had to happen so it's a lovely lovely watch Yeah, I have nothing more to add. Great movie, guys. Go watch it. It's on Hotstar <laughs> if you're watching it. <laughs> oh no! Uh, oh, is it? Nice. I'll yeah, it's on Hotstar. So yeah. Hmm. So like, please go check it out. And if you if you need to know where it's playing on your local streaming service, you can check out Unogs or just watch and figure it out. But yeah, that was a uh, road to perdition. Or uh, we haven't got into yours yet. Let's do it. I'm going <laughs> to open a whole can of worms now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. uh okay. talk about the movie which probably came to everyone's mind first when thinking about you know graphic novel adaptations which are about superheroes which is uh, 2006 2005 or 6 is uh, Viva Vendetta directed by uh, James McTeague more importantly based on Alan Moore's graphic novel of the same name again i'm using based very loosely here uh, i'm sure fala will have to say a lot more on that Uh, but before before I, I hand the mic over to him for his uh, diatribe uh, just my two my two cents on the film um i think at the time when i watched it and i think i watched around the time of release when i was what 16 17 very impressionable uh, loved the movie i remember at the time oh, it's, a, it's a very, yeah it's a very quotable mm-hmm. film in its defense right when when you don't think too deeply it's got quips right like, uh, ideas are bulletproof and all like oh the sounds cool so i remember i used to i rewatch the movie a fair bit probably more than i ca- i care to admit today right so uh, and it felt very uh, deep at the time uh, now i re- uh, now i realize how naive i was and how naive the movie is right because uh, as and when you you start to learn more about how things happen around the world or they have happened around the world over the decades and centuries you realize that evil is a lot less overt and a lot more surreptitious right uh the evil in this movie like fascism that they've shown in the movie yes it is an allusion to what happened in europe and stuff in the 30s and uh, 40s but i would say that's an outlier of evil being that naked it being that uh, overt and flashy about it right most of the time the evil is a little under the surface it's co-opting things you don't even realize you're being screwed over right and these are things that that th- these happen to us all the time they're happening to us today they will continue to happen uh so in hindsight i'm like bro the world is not this black and white we are all navigating a sea of gray I think I debate that because uh, I mean you know the country we live in right now and what we are going through is currently. So I feel like it's not covert at all. And I feel like the movie Vipo Vendetta has an interesting point because when the whole COVID uh, uh, the COVID outbreak happened, my first thought was Vipo Vendetta because that does that whole Saint Mary's virus <laughs> that goes out, uh, which kind of gives the right wing an excuse to like uh, like you know intern people in camps and whatnot and like what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the parallel the movie holds to the present, like at least like uh, last decade or so, is kind of strange because like the moment COVID happened, my first thought was, hey, this is what happens in Vipo Vendetta. <laughs> no, which is true. Like what's happening in our country today, maybe, and even what's happening in the US for the last uh, seven eight years, probably are. Uh, outliers to the larger trend and but think of it over the last century right with the exception of these events and say the 30s and 40s in europe 
it's not like bad shit stopped right it just was a lot better at covering its tracks i just feel uh things that happen at a global scale a lot of it is not immediately perceptible right yeah. unless you take the effort to educate yourself you take the effort to uh read about what's happening and you know go one level deeper uh i just feel the movie is a bit black and white uh now that i i mm. mean in hindsight when i look back at it it's a little too black and white think things don't play out uh the equivalent of that would be if, if if today in india or or in the us there was this one figure who could come and change everything like bro that's not happening yeah Well, but that's also where I think the the bad the genre description kind of is weird, no? Because like I think V is also a superhero in certain sort of sense. He goes through a tragedy, is transformed, has superpowers in terms of how he fights and stuff. So I do think V still falls under a superhero category, in my opinion. And it's also black and white because it's hard to adapt like a four hundred page graphic novel into like one and a half half film. Like the movie that's is like a pop phenomenon. Like no. I happened to own a signed copy of V for Vendetta. It was signed by Dave Gibbons, uh, and uh, like I am one of those people who I think when I watched the movie first, I quite liked it. I think it is quite influential. But in the retro, in in once you read the graphic novel and you actually see the source material, the movie doesn't hold water after that because like that's like Watchmen all over like, again. <laughs> yeah. No, I actually think uh, Zack Snyder's Watchmen is better than the graphic novel, whereas oh. I feel like *We Shall Be Men* the graphic novel is like. Yeah, I think the ending is superior in *Watchmen*, like in my opinion. So uh, in the movie, uh, the wait. movie ending is an improvement on the graphic novel. I feel because well, more, more giant squid. Vendetta, yeah, yeah, in the book it's giant squid, where it's here it's like Doctor Manhattan's mm-hmm. power recreated, so it kind of I think ties mm-hmm. it better. But in *Vifo mm-hmm. Vendetta*, like I think the core of the book is trying to preach anarchy. It's trying to like say that okay, you don't need V, you can do it yourself, sort of a thing. That was I think the running theme of the graphic novel. And I think anarchy ka mention bhi nahi hota hai movie mein. Like you know, like people like it for different reasons. I think I had an ex who really liked the Stephen Fry's character in *Vifo Vendetta* mm-hmm. and how they have a collection of art, and that character is completely different in the graphic novel. Some people have varied opinions of how it's been adapted. Also, I think a quick shout out needs to go to Hugo Weaving, who never really got to show mm-hmm. his face in the film, but manages to give a very good performance, right? Through sheer voice acting. He wasn't the first acting. choice either. Like he wasn't the first choice, and in it was a recast that he got uh, into the role. Oh. I think somebody else was playing the character first, and then they kind of had to step out. And Hugo Weaving was the second choice the in the movie. No, thank God for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, This is is produced by the Wachowskis, isn't it? It's not. It's directed by somebody else. Uh, yeah, yeah. Produced and written by. Even the script is written or adaptation has been written by the Wachowskis. Which brings me to the other rant I had going on is how the Wachowskis steal from graphic novels without ever giving credit. So everybody uh-huh. like knows them for the Matrix, and the Matrix's core plot is actually like literally ripped off from uh, Invisibles by Grant Morrison. If you've read the Invisibles, or somebody's out there, read the Invisibles, and the whole plot of there is a small group of people. They find a chosen one. There's a mafia like bot, uh, bald tattoo, dresses in leather, and wears cool shades. Uh, they find the chosen one. The chosen one is the person who helps them break down the ba- bad guys who are like an all, like an big evil kind of who have a lot of machines and whatnot. Like they pretty much ripped off the whole of the Matrix ka main plot, at least the first film, from the Invisibles. If you read the Invisibles, it's like they took, and maybe like the Matrix two and three are bad because I think they stopped copying the Invisibles because I was just, I was just about to bring it up. The, yeah, like had they stuck to the Invisibles stealing, then it might have gone well for the trilogy. But because they stopped stealing from the Invisibles, is why the the series goes off the rocker, I think. Mm-hmm. uh let's stay in in the same vein of like since we discuss we we're, we're discussing politics and anarchy it's only right we discuss some communism as well and i did not till this morning i did not know that our next movie was a uh, a graphic novel and it is one of my favorite films of all time right i fucking love this movie <laughs> yeah uh, this is <laughs> the death of stalin by armando ayunochi the, the plot revolves around the fact that stalin dies from a stroke uh, 
uh, that he gets after reading a note from this uh, rogue pianist, I think. The, and what follows is a, is a series of comedic events and a lot of backstabbing, which for me, I, I, w- I watched this movie on a flight somewhere. I was coming back from Pune or something and I just had it on my laptop. And I was, and I spent the entire flight just stupidly laughing at my screen. It is an oh. absolutely phenomenal watch if you haven't seen it. I've anything Armando Yunuchi does. I think his his series Veep is uh, something yeah. I need to get into. It's one of Rohit's yeah. favorites. I know Veep's insults are top tier. I and think what Yunuchi you, you guys are into like later Yunuchi. Like if you actually look at Yunuchi's earlier work, stuff like In the Loop and like mm-hmm. his work with Darren Partridge and stuff. For me, I like, love to bring it up. His yes. latest stuff is far like uh, lesser. In, I like because Death of Stalin is a film I was like really looking forward to watching. Because I've mm. been a big fan of his work and when I saw that he's making a new movie, I'm like, oh, it's so exciting. But when I watched it, I found it very mid, like in the sense where, yeah, it's funny, you know, I did not know it was a graphic novel. But I found it very mm. mid compared to his previous work, which is, I think, phenomenal. I love all of his previous work. But in comparison, mm. the thick of it compared to In the Loop and stuff like that, I think like it was like, uh, yeah, you get all the money and you get the stars, but I think the comedy I felt takes a hit. Yeah, no, ironically for me, the first time I watched it, I I struggled yeah. to laugh at the jokes, not because they were badly written. In hindsight, now I find the movie a lot funnier. But if you mm-hmm. read about what happened around Stalin's, mm-hmm. not just his death, right? His, his Politburo, his inner circle, the way he treated them and events that followed immediately after his death. There is very little embellishment in the movie. It's just that the yeah. point of view the movie has taken is a humorous one. The events that they've shown, for the most part, actually played out in that manner. And it's okay to see things play out in this manner as a comedy, right? But if you take the humor out of it, you're like, this is a fucked up state of affairs, right? Like one man had, <laughs> had built such a cult of personality and had so much sway over everyone that even after his death, it's like they're almost afraid of insulting his memory, insulting his ghost. It's it's sad, right? Like you see how they're tiptoeing around taking actions, and the well, the whole state of you know uh, state of fear that he had built. Everyone was like, "Hey, we shouldn't say the wrong thing," and you know everyone's yeah. backstabbing each other. And these actually these things actually happened. I I was listening to this podcast on Stalin where uh, what he used to do was he used to call his inner circle, which is what is shown in the movie, right? And he used to get everyone hammered, right? And yeah. he probably had an iron iron stomach, so he could like. Uh, handle his alcohol but he would make sure people were sloshed and then he would ask them questions which could put them in a compromising position right he purposely wanted to like make people uncomfortable and if you slipped up you were sent off and so you can't even like Gulag. unwind right you, you yeah Gulag. so you don't have the option of not drinking but you have to even if you're sloshed you have, it's such a horrible situation to be in right and this was a scenario like wow. twice thrice a week so a lot yeah. of what's shown in the movie is kind of real. So the first time I watched it, I was like, haha, sad. I mean, funny, but sad. Over time, I'm like, yeah, I, I know all that happened. Let's just enjoy it uh, for the humor and I can appreciate it a little more. I I don't disagree with what Farah's saying. Like I find if I were to compare a TV series and uh, a movie, right? Like let's take Veep as an example. I find Veep to be a superior, uh, you know, work of, art order compared to death of Stalin, but I, I the movie has its moments and you know speaking of which i think far and away the best actor and character in in the film is zukov like jason isaac zukov is far yeah. and away the funniest thing about the movie the moment he enters the film you're like okay it just goes up a notch also i think the film is very interesting it starts with a nice uh, i think they're playing the opera or something but they're then broadcasting on radio and right after they finish this mm-hmm. elaborate performance, they're like, we need to record it for Stalin. I think that kind of like sets the tone of like the, when you're trying to get yeah. people back together and shows how farcical it is. And I think sets the tone of what you're going to expect from the rest of the movie sort of a thing. There's yeah. a line yeah. in the movie, I think, which that comes from Beria and he, I, I forget, maybe, maybe I misquoted, he talks about like they have somebody, um, they have somebody locked up and they're trying to get his wife and his wife is trying to beg for his freedom and he mentions a thing saying oh you can just like sleep as a no, nobody fucks better than a wife desperate to save her husband's life uh <laughs> and which is and i might have paraphrased it but i remember watching that i'm going oh 
and then having like Rohit said, having gone and read up the atrocities, it was very commonplace for. Uh, they watered it down in the movie. So in reality, Beria uh-huh. used to he used to have a black limousine that would drive around Moscow at night, and he would if he found some woman good looking, he would just tell his bodyguard just pick her up, and uh, they they would be in another car. They would just get her to his Dhaka, and uh, obviously mm-hmm. there was no consent. What is consent to yeah. these guys, right? Uh, it was literally like just ab- like abducting women off the street, and this was like a weekly, almost daily affair for Beria. So they watered it down in the film. Mm-hmm. So it's like the the old idiom uh, adage, right? Like tragedy plus time equals comedy. Given yeah. time, yeah. we can make exactly. it. We can see it the humor of it, but at the time it was happening, probably definitely horrific. Perfect example of that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, for you those of you come from the sorry, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, I'm just recommending the film. Those of you who haven't, please. Oh, definitely. Watch it. It's yeah. So Ian and she comes from this whole scene. Where I think he was a godfather to people like Steve Coogan, Charlie Brooker. All of them sort of came out, yeah. came from under his wing. I think the first time I became aware of Inuchi is that there's a show called The Day to Day, which is by Chris Morris. Chris Morris is the director of movies like Four Lions and. Uh, he made another yeah. film recently, but I forget. But so they they had a show called The Day Today, and Inuchi was the co-creator of the show. They did new satire, after which from which the character Iron Partridge was born, which Steve Coogan played very famously in multiple series and mm-hmm. movies. I'm Alan Partridge, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. Uh, so then you have like even Charlie Brooker and stuff working under him to then later going on to create Black Mirror and stuff. So Inuchi in a way is an institution to himself. Yeah. Uh, to the talent he's worked with, the talent he's nurtured, the talent he's actually like, uh, uh, I mean, the kind of comedy itself that uh, that he's given rise, that dry comedy. Interesting. But okay, I think we have we have uh, waxed lyrical about Armando Iannucci for, for for quite some time. If you don't know, we're all fans. Some well, of his uh, some of his please. entire discography, <laughs> filmography, some his earlier work. Anyway, but that was mine. Um, let's move on. Follow. Let's take yours next. It is a mm. film that is, I think, very important to uh, me now because I think it's the one that made me want to write comic books. I think I was at a very, like, uh, bad time in my life in the sense where, like, I just moved back to Bangalore having quit my job at the Viral Fever TVF, this YouTube channel that most people might know of. And, like, filmmaking wasn't really working out because, like, you know, I, have a, I had all of these grand ideas but never the budgets to, like, you know, execute them. And I was home, having quit my job, I haven't moved back in with family, and I end up like putting on this film by star Paul Giamatti called American Splendor. It had been lying on my hard disk for donkey's years. But this time I hit play, and I was like, oh shit. It was so fucking funny. Uh, it's like, it's, it's about Harvey Picard. Harvey Picard was an influential figure in the underground comic scene in the 1970s and stuff. And he was a contemporary of Robert Crumb. Uh, so the story goes that like uh, uh, Harvey Picard was just a hospital clerk. He was a file pusher in a hospital in I think Cleveland, Ohio or something like that. And he used to like listen to people tell stories, like listen to everyday conversation, write like little stories based on that. And one time Robert Crumb was traveling through town and was staying with a friend or something. And he presented his like stick figure drawings to Crumb. And Crumb went, hey, this is brilliant. I'll draw one for you type of a thing. And that kind of like mm-hmm. birthed this uh, alternative comic scene in the US where like uh, Crumb and him and a few others were contemporaries who were like doing uh, comics that were for adults uh, dealing with uh, sex and other like crude humor and stuff like that, which was kind of like considered very like underground at the time, like compared to the superhero comics that were famous at the time. And the movie does a great job of adapting his story because there's multiple layers of meta playing out because there's Paul Giamatti playing him. There's the actual person, Harvey Picard, commenting on how the movie is being shot. And later on, Picard went on to write a graphic novel called My Movie Year, which is based on his experience in Hollywood and how his uh, comic book was being adapted into like a movie and stuff. So it's a super meta film. And uh, it was one of those that made me go, man, if this guy can write comics, so can I. And uh, Musulman went from being like a video sketch idea into a comic book idea thanks to like this film. 
I hold it very dear to me because kind of like it's one of those things that either showed me the way or nudged me in the direction that I'm supposed that I am currently going in, and I've been in on it for like seven years now writing comics. And it was this movie that kind of like pushed me in the direction of writing comics, and it it was just a hilarious movie. And anybody who's quirky, who's like obsessive, compulsive about collecting old records, old books, or whatever, relates so much to this character. And uh, and also, what is very funny to me is that uh, like Harvey Pekar also became famous because he was featured on the David Letterman show quite a lot. Like Letterman mm-hmm. would always call him on as a guest, and Pekar would be like this character who would play a character of whether I don't know if he actually hated his experience, but he'd completely diss the whole Hollywood mechanism that's trying to make him popular. Like he would come on Letterman and just diss the act of ce- the idea of celebrity and not wanting to be there despite being there. So American Splendor. I've seen. Uh, I haven't checked it out. I need. This is something I need to see. Yeah, neither have I. Sounds very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and uh, so this is one of the apparent here. I think Faraz's passion was apparent. He he had this flow talking about it. It clearly was coming from some place for him. <laughs> That's got me interested to watch the movie more than anything else. <laughs> Who directed American Splendor? Um, uh, you'll have to look it up. I don't remember. I just know that it stars yeah. Paul Giamatti, and that was the reason I watched it because I think Paul Giamatti has this interesting filmography. I think I saw Sideways, uh, which uh, mm-hmm. by Alexander Payne around the same time. So I always find Paul Giamatti like a very interesting character actor. He's like yeah. one of those. If he's in the cast, you might want to like look it up, like Holdovers, yeah, that came out this year, That's like or whatever. If he's on the cast, you would want to check it out because he's always like known to pick these interesting films. And this film really puts him front and center and lets him like totally like, like you know, showcase his range in a beautiful manner. And might have probably been instrumental in him getting landing all of the later roles as well. I think it was one of those star making mm-hmm. performances on Jay Marty part. Jay Marty's part. I think this was the time mm-hmm. there were a lot of like these author driven adaptations. It wasn't. Adaptation also mm. around this time. Around the same time, yeah, yeah, yeah I guess. Adaptation, uh, Nicholas Cage and. Also, this is in a way uh, early two thousands was like the golden age of at least for our generation, golden age of Indies, Indies. right? Little Miss Sunshine, mm. American Splendor, mm. Sideways. So, like, there's this YouTube channel that I watch where this person plays a character called Martin Scorsese and pretends to review, like, pretends to be Scorsese and reviews films <laughs> like Bedazzled and. Uh, like all of these MIB and stuff like that, he says cinema ended in the year two thousand two when Spider Man swung into theaters. So <laughs> <laughs> that uh, definitely so, yeah, is a like, culture. He's not. I mean, he's not wrong. It's a cultural moment for sure. Like I, I very. If you actually think about it, and he's not, he's not wrong at all. Like the impact Spider Man, the first Spider Man had, because nobody with that movie was like in in dev hell for years, right? And what we saw on screen for the first time was like. It changed the way we view blockbusters. That entire two thousand one, two thousand three, their blockbusters changed forever. I think you know, I would at least like delay it to the impact of the Iron Man movie. I think like Iron I was Man just gonna say it was when Iron, Iron Man released when things changed absolutely because we've had mm. like yeah. we've had Batman movies before. We've had an entire what three or four movies of Superman uh, before. Spider Man is not unique in that sense, but. For better or worse, MCU built something which spanned for like almost a, more than a decade, right? It's still going on, not so well mm-hmm. of late. When Iron Man came in, and you could see things were, you know, because they built this interconnected universe, the expectation on you as a viewer were was that you have to watch all of them to keep abreast of the larger plot line. I, I mm-hmm. firstly I dislike that you know that it puts that pressure on you, but that made superhero movie watching. How do I put this? You're almost dependent on it, right? Because yeah, and it, they made it mainstream. Everyone's watching it. You don't want to get left out of the conversation, so you got to watch everything because everything's connected. Oh. It's all very annoying and stupid, but uh, that changed. Uh, I feel that changed movie viewing behavior a lot more than uh, Spider-Man trilogy. We've had superhero movies before. I I think I would again disagree with the thing. I think the post-credit scene of Batman Begins does that. When Batman begins, where Gordon meets him and presents him with a Joker card, is when we got Not all these films. The that all hmm. the last scene of oh. Batman Begins. I think hmm. that does that in a way, in my opinion, because after that, every movie was trying to set up a franchise, like whether it's Sherlock Holmes oh, or this fair, or that. Fair. Everyone, we stopped getting a complete story in films 
and then you always had teasers for sequels coming in a big Fair, way from I think Batman Begins. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, well, I was literally watching it yesterday. It was uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's a whole other conversation. Anyway, uh, I think it got away from American Slender completely. I guess like I think yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we we went down. We went down the road. That we yeah, just like we end up like bro, talking about superheroes no matter what. I guess. I hate that that it happens. I consciously try not. No, but to that's also the thing, right? Things. Like, uh, and I think what I'm great at is plugging myself again. And I think for me, Muslim man again is like a deconstruction superhero. Even though people think because it's, it, it takes a superhero genre and is a, in an attempt to deconstruct it. Because right now in the storyline, there's a character called Chairman Mouse who is Mickey Mouse, who <laughs> is the representative of Disney, who's the villain. And he's basically pitching to Muslim man that I'll build you a franchise, but at the cost of so and so. So I think like like even Muslim man like uh, was born out of my hatred for the superhero films. Like after a point, I was so angry at them that I wanted to deconstruct it, and that's kind of where the intention of Muslim man comes from. Even though maybe in the process of writing it, I might have fallen more in love with superhero films. But like I think it it was an oh, angry yeah. reaction yes. to like Disney. <laughs> You have no commercial aspirations with this. Take on this. Well, there's been more. Some of the shit he said in that thing, I'm like, dude, hala, come on. Man. <laughs> my earlier, like, my my whole rant about the Marvel films is the fact that they serve as such blatant American propaganda. Like, I can go up on like a whole like spiel of how uh, Guardians of the Galaxy is basically like a Zionist propaganda film. And then, like, um, how Captain Marvel, uh, like, because like, see, Nova Prime is like, you know, Caucasian people who are live, living on a land that does not belong to them. Uh, the Cree people are colored people whose uh, race has been subjugated, and they want revenge. That's what, like, that, uh, they, like, what is that? Ronan, Ronan, yeah, Ronan, yeah, Ronan, Ronan, yeah. Ronan is about. This is very Palestine. Ronan, 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 yeah, and and then like you have Guardians who are like America who comes and like saves the day. For me, like when I saw <laughs> Guardians the first time round, I thought this was like complete Zionist propaganda. And from that point yeah. on, the MCU broke yeah. apart. And then you have like yeah. stuff like Cap and Marvel, where like it's basically American Air Force propaganda films. So that's what my problem with the MCU has always been that they're like, and I feel like even like the Infinity Wars and Endgame films. Or like a precursor to the pandemic, they were trying to get us used to the idea that half the world's population is going to disappear, and we'll all be That's like uh-huh. okay with it. Like, like you know, like everybody like Team Thanos, he's right because, uh, yeah. like, and they kind of like sold the pandemic to us in a way. I feel that's my opinion. I think larger, larger uh, game there. They're, they're uh, prepping us for global warming, right? They're like, hey, half the population mm-hmm. dying. We've seen this before, so it's totally fine. Well, anyway, I feel like we have been sucked into this this uh, black hole of superhero films. I think we'll try and I will pull ourselves out of it um, for Murph's sake. Anyway, uh, let's uh, let's move. I think, I think nice Rhodes, movie. Yeah, yeah your yeah. final. We're on the last one, yes. I just realized uh, my final movie. The guys have not superhero abilities so much as super bullshit abilities. But uh, with that caveat, the, the movie I'm talking about is 2008's Wanted. For those of you who don't know, I don't even know how to explain the plot of this film, right? So basically, there is a secret group of assassins who control events at a global scale, but they work out of a uh, a defunct textile mill. Like, I don't oh. make that make sense. <laughs> and uh, the whole premise of this movie is that these um, bunch of assassins have this ability that when they get an adrenaline rush, uh, they can show the finger to the laws of physics, right? <laughs> it's like, fuck Newton, I have I have adrenaline surging through me. They can bend bullets and they, they that's what they show in the movie, right? He like, he, he flips his gun oh. in some way while shooting and the bullets bend. Like, what, what? <laughs> Bro, this movie is damn cool, dude. Like, I, I like, I will not handle any slander for how stupid and how awesome this movie is. Like, it's so, it's such an outrageous yeah, I, concept. Like, uh, Chris Pat is the co-worker that gets beaten by the keyboard in this very cool sequence in the film. Fuck you, with like, the, uh, with the you. Fuck you, it says fuck you. This is pre-Parks and Rec Chris Pratt also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and oh, the right. souls, I, I mean i haven't even scratched the surface of all the bullshit in the movie so you have these <laughs> physics defying bullet bending so assassins angelina, angelina jolie who is like super hot in this oh, hot as fuck super hot in this <laughs> yeah <laughs> super hot but uh, putting that aside the way the targets in this movie are selected there's something called the loom of fate which is a fucking hand loom that prints out the name of i'm like what is going on guys where is governance in this organization what is your <laughs> sop what is happening <laughs> is oh it has like it has one of the most the ins- most insane climactic fight sequences re- involving Angelina Jolie which i remember watching in like for the first time i watched and i went that bullshit but i was so fucking <laughs> <laughs> the one where the, mean, the bullet goes all over you... yeah 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 it goes <laughs> just like the fuck is happening the bullet has endless momentum dude it's kill 10 people it's still going <laughs> No, Talker, somebody yeah. step back. No, the moment it's hit somebody else, the others just need to step back. And <laughs> the plot of this movie is over. They've seen those no, memes, no? Right. It shows directed by Robert Wade. <laughs> somebody just step back. It's the end of the movie. <laughs> I yeah. think it's a fair companion piece with Salman Khan's Wanted. You know, it's like I was just about to bring it up. I was like, I was like, like Wanted walk, so feature. Wanted could run. <laughs> it can be a double feature. You have Wanted and Wanted double screening where you can show this one first and then buy second or whatever. because like it was the two wanted i think the second wanted is uh, like bhai's wanted is when bollywood broke you know when they start when they went overboard yeah. with the south indian adaptations and they gave prabhu deva the reins of like uh, what yes, should be like the movie and then it'll it'll be yahan bhi hoga wahan bhi hoga screening imagine you do imagine you do a double feature of wanted and wanted there's like netflix people knocking at your door sir hame khabar mili yahan pe bakchodi chal rahi hai aap kya kar rahe ho oh my god dude i think i when my i think i actually haven't seen either wanted fully i don't have definitely not seen the sun man man Like I think I've seen scenes from this. I definitely seen this wanted on TV when it's been running. But I don't think I sat down and watched it in its entirety ever. Uh, and I, I think it was both movies. My eternal oh, shame. Okay. I went to a theater <laughs> to watch the James McAvoy film. Oh, <laughs> I no, not. I don't worry. I watched. I I watched the Salman movie in theater. I I would want to be on this. <laughs> <laughs> no, on principle, I want both Salman. That's a whole other thing. But dude, now this whole wanted and wanted double feature needs to happen. We should make this happen. Fun. Let's screen it. <laughs> It's like, guys, how do you want to watch wanted and wanted at the same time? It's a great idea. That brings us to the end of this episode. I don't think it could have ended in a more uh, derailed <laughs> manner. <laughs> like, like comparing wanted and wanted together. This is. purely like a true testament of the guests for on this episode and the conversation has fucking <laughs> yo yo to places i never thought were possible but that's how i love it uh, our viewers i don't know if we love it as much but it's okay we do this for us and you do it for them so, uh before we go fala i want to thank you for coming on and i want the people to i want you to let the people know what you've been up to and where they can find you so the floor is yours please take it away All right. So after many years of delay, I finally managed to put together a website. You can read all of my comics on this website called MusalmanComics dot com. M U S A L M A N C O C O M I X dot com. And X because again, it's underground comics, a homage to the kind of comics that Harvey Pekar and Crumb made. They used to call it C O M I X. So it's MusalmanComics dot com. And I think uh, a couple of days ago, I put out a new video on my YouTube channel, a Fala Faisal joint, which is called "Founded Majestic," in which I take a walking tour of Majestic with this author called Zach Oya, who's written this uh, detective fiction series that's set in Bangalore. The Swedish author, but lives in Bangalore, he's written the series called "The Mr. Majestic." So I did a walk through Majestic with him, where he showed me places that inspired his novel or feature in his novel. So Fala Faisal joined on YouTube, Musalman Comics for the comics, and Gonzo Graham on Instagram. If you want to find me and personally discuss any of these films that we mentioned, and more, Fala watches more like key shit. Don't don't just because he's like talking about Harvey Pickard and Robert Crumb. No no, he watches like random Bollywood crap. Don't 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 let that face fool you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, I think that's it. Uh, we'll be back again also, in a I mean, week or I two. I feel like th- that can be like an extra segment. I feel like um, I've fallen in love with the MCU in the phase five. Like the more experimental weird shit. I think I have a soft spot for uh, Thor, Love and Thunder. Oh, for, 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 I have. I, I understand. I understand people having that having that soft spot for multiverse of madness thought love and thunder was like these guys were yeah, engaging yeah. in whatever they're engaging in and then they yeah. made a movie as a, like a byproduct of it no so i have a special category of movies i put in the category called bong hit movies it's movies that inspire me to take a bong hit midway so that i appreciate the rest of the movie better so okay. thought love and thunder definitely falls under my bong hit movie category because it's just like stupid fun like oh, it doesn't necessarily like and enjoy the visual, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think like the latter half of the MCU, like post Endgame and post in, uh, is where I think in Endgame they had a plan and everything was working according to plan. Whereas now they have no clue what they're doing. They're having to <laughs> uh, ditch like storylines and like bring back people, and they're going full extra poor right now. So I feel like <laughs> I weirdly like this. This version and if their writers are fucking up, than... their their uh, the actors that they are building the next phase around them are having domestic violence charges. It's like, yeah, I can't control all these contingencies. <laughs> What's happening? The M- the MCU has gone full Manchester United at this point. <laughs> <laughs> wow! But, that, um... that, 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 wow! Oh dear God! I'm not <laughs> I'm not talking about. <laughs> I just I would record a football podcast after this is a whole other thing on this conversation, but lovely. Uh, yeah, oh, no, I, I think that was my point take. No, speaking <laughs> of bong hit films, I have like taken like Pala <laughs> has famously we have gone to watch I think Birdman, the two narrator films, Birdman and Revenant. I think Birdman he had like an amazing experience. Revenant because it's like one fucking it's like I think the movie shaking you for for three hours. <laughs> Pala was, I was like, dude, ask, what the that, heck? That cannot have been pleasant. <laughs> Oh, Revenant, I don't think was pleasant. I yeah. remember him having a bad time. Revenant is just like a whole bunch of people suffering in cold and horrible circumstances, like for Gio's Oscar. So, yeah. <laughs> Gio's Oscar. For most acting. It's like, most anyway, acting. the whole other conversation. Yeah, it's like, imagine Mark Hamill being like, dude, he just, what, he got into like a horse? I did this 60 years ago. I mean, 30, 40 years ago. What the fuck? <laughs> but, yeah. But anyway... Uh, we that's us, my friend. We have, yeah, we're just digressing. <laughs> this is like the digress episode. <laughs> but uh, that brings us to the end of this episode. Uh, I will leave links to Fala's Instagram, his website, uh, the Muslim Man link, uh, links everything in the comments. Please feel free to go check him out. He's much more famous than us. Uh, so uh, we will see you on the next episode. Infamous. Until then, uh, in Shata Shata Fala. <laughs> 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 uh, we'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye. Jai Shri Allah.